Right. So we are dealing with periodic classification, a very important theoretical chapter for people who are writing their advanced JE exams or the mains exams or the pre-medical tests. And remember that before you write your aptitude tests, these are aptitude tests rather. And remember that you should be very good at your concepts, right? <clears throat> Since it is a theoretical question, I was a theoretical chapter, I was always telling you anyone who is good at chemistry will be good at periodic classification because the entire chemistry revolves around what the periodic classification, you must understand that. So it is not a simple thing. I would love to remind you again and again whenever I was dealing with this chapter that remember that the entire chemistry revolves around it and it's not trivial, it's not uh, simple, it's not silly. It is driven by principles, it is driven by schemes. It is, it is actually governed by rules rather. You must understand. So it's not that someone gave you certain amount of elements and asked you to distribute and take a pen and a scale and you have just drawn a periodic classification. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. If you look into the modern periodic table, it has 18 groups. As, as we said, groups, a group is always uh, done on some basis, on some basis, some rules, some schemes. It's not that, you know, you have placed it in a random way. They have rules. They are governed by rules, governed by principles. And of course, the schemes of distributions of electrons, you must understand. So, 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 also remember two things, two, three points which I would like to remind you when you get into the periodic classification. Number one, you have infinite number of periods. You have infinite number of periods in a periodic table, right? Why, why infinite number of periods in a periodic table? For the simple reason you have infinite number of what? Shells, infinite number of what? Orbits. And each orbit is a shell and each period is regarded to be a shell. So since we have infinite number of shells, you also have infinite number of what periods. But what is, what, is, uh, 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 what is very strange is the seventh period itself is incomplete. The seventh period itself is incomplete. So we have still eighth, ninth, tenth and you have infinite number of what periods indicating that if tomorrow, if any element from now, from 40, 50 years is also found, the position of that element is absolutely fixed in the periodic table, which looks to me even strange, surprising the way the periodic table has been placed. You must understand that, right? So, so it's not a trivial thing. It's a serious thing. And the chemistry revolves around it. You must understand. As I said, I always, I always tell you it stimulates research. It stimulates research. And you know, uh, as I was telling some guiding principles and rules that are governed uh, while framing the periodic table, one of the things is, you know, one of the things is atomic radii or atomic size. You must understand atomic size. So the mode of activity of all these elements that are present in the periodic table, when I'm referring to mode of activity, I'm basically referring to their physical or chemical properties. You have 130 odd elements in the periodic table and still you have place for several elements which is to be found in future. And remember that the physical and chemical properties of these elements or the mode of activity of these elements are all governed by atomic radii. So the significant thing in the periodic table is their sizes. So why cesium behave differently? Why lanthanides behave differently? And why halogens behave differently? Why noble gases behave differently? It's all about what? It's all about what? It all, it's all about sizes. So even the modern periodic law which we are dealing uh, is dependent upon the, the periodic law which states that all the physical and chemical properties of elements are functions of atomic sizes. So the most critical thing, the most critical thing of all these elements, their behavioral uh, properties like your physical and chemical properties are all functions of atomic radii you must understand, are all functions of atomic radii. Right. So when we started off, we started off with atomic radii, you must understand. And we, we had some difficulties and we somehow uh, proposed what operational definitions in the form of what covalent radii. Uh, you have ionic radii, you have van der Waals radius, you have metallic radius. Right. After we defined, then we went on to discuss some properties which are functions of these atomic radii. So all the, all the properties which we call periodic properties, which repeat itself at regular intervals are functions of this atomic radii. So the entire chapter is atomic radii dependent. You must understand. In fact, the chemistry itself is dependent upon what? The atomic radii, right? That's, that's what is the thinking, the mature thinking which one must be having. 
For example, I was defining uh, electropositivity, then I was telling about electronegativity, then I'm speaking of electron affinity, then I was speaking of lanthanide contraction, then I was speaking of ionization potential. If you look into all these, if you look into all these, all these are atomic radii dependent. All these are atomic radii dependent which will be repeating itself at regular intervals and such properties can be called as what periodic properties you must understand that right well what I will do well I will consolidate all the things as a single document for you as a single document for you where this document can be used for a quick revision when someone is writing his exam uh, in the coming days you must understand for a quick revision but before that I wanted to discuss in detail one more periodic property which is extremely important till date I think we have discussed all this discussion done for atomic radii we have done the intense discussion for what atomic radii and then we discussed about electropositivity then we discussed about electropositivity then we discussed about electronegativity. Then we discussed about ionization potential. Ionization potential, if you remember. And then we have electron affinity. Electron affinity and we have special focus on shielding effect. And then we discussed about lanthanide contraction lanthanide contraction and we discussed about oxidizing power also for non-metals right now what we are discussing is basically understand uh, we let's let's go and check out some more periodic properties which are extremely important and the, the one is this one observe carefully here reducing powers Reducing powers, let's discuss in detail this reducing powers and then I will consolidate it by writing all the important points at one place. That will be the scheme of discussion for today. Right, so let us discuss even reducing powers, uh, how these reducing powers are actually varying uh, in the periodic table, which is also important. And remember that whenever we speak of reducing powers, reducing powers are basically told for non-metals, sorry, metals. Remember that metals are very good what reducing agents and how do they vary observe carefully let's frame a function for them remember reducing power is basically a function of size it is a function of size and you are termed to be a very good reducing agent if you can actually vomit electrons on someone right if I am actually vomiting electrons on the neighboring atom, then the other atom is actually reduced and I am very good reducing agent, you must understand. So normally the tendency which metals have is to vomit electrons. When you vomit electrons, I think you are a very good what, reducing agent. And this vomiting tendency, what we are speaking of in chemistry, is nothing but electropositivity, you must understand. So I can simply say, before I go for reducing power to be a function of size, but let us interject that with another what, a periodic property, such that we have a better understanding. So what we are discussing is reducing power. Reducing power is basically told for metals. And uh, you, must have, you must know some properties of metals. Metals are placed to the extreme left in the periodic table. Extreme left bottom are very good metals, right? So if the metals are placed to the extreme left, they must be having the biggest sizes. They must be having the biggest sizes because from left to right in a period, the size decreases, right? So you find the best metals to the extreme left. So extreme left. So I can simply say, Reducing power is directly proportional to the metallic character. The metallic character, you must understand. What do you mean by metallic character? Metallic character is really high when you are placed to the extreme left bottom of the periodic table. The extreme left bottom of the periodic table, right? So when you are placed to the extreme left bottom of the periodic table, then you are the best metal. When you are the best metal, I think you have the biggest sizes. When you have the biggest sizes, the outermost electron is actually relaxing. It's basically relaxing. When it relaxes, I think it is easy for you to remove the electron. So the ease with which an atom will be losing the electron, the electropositivity would be higher 
and then it's uh, easy for you to remove the electron and hence I say the reducing powers would be what more so the easily an element is losing an electron will be possessing the highest reducing power you must understand so if the element is able to lose the electrons very very easily so its vomiting tendency of electrons is very very high then I think the reducing power also will be what higher right so reducing power is basically a function of size I can also say reducing power is a proportional to what metallic character in fact if you want me to introduce then reducing power would be higher if the electron vomiting tendency that electron vomiting tendency is nothing but electropositivity electropositive the tendency to lose what electrons if it is high the reducing power is what high if you see rp proportional to ep which is proportional to metallic character i think you should be uh, you should agree with me rather because greater the metallic character the greater is the vomiting tendency for the electrons so all the three are directly relation watch carefully here so reducing power electropositivity and metallic character all are directly proportional and if you if you are showing if you are exhibiting electron vomiting tendency that you vomit we wanted to vomit electrons because of your larger sizes because you are a very good metal then I think it's easy for me to remove the electron from you because you're already showing some tendency now if that is the case it's easy to remove what the electron so it's easy means the ionization potential is inversely related to it you must understand smaller will be the ionization potential if the metallic character is high the IP would be smaller lesser if the electropositivity what is high and even ionization potential will be smaller if you have the RP to be what higher so greater the reducing power greater is the electropositivity in fact the reverse would be uh, good to actually discuss in fact if the IP is lesser then it shows best metallic character and if it is less if it is more metallic so if the IP is lesser it is more metallic more metallic more electropositive more electropositive more reducing power you must understand so it is more reducing power more electropositivity more metallic character and it is lesser what electropositivity you must understand this now what we will do we will simplify it further what we will do is we will simplify it further how to simplify is we are since we are discussing reducing power then remember that rp rp reducing power is also a function of size in fact if you see rp is directly proportional to size you must understand because if the size is more if the size is more if the size is more then the ionization potential would be lesser if the ip is lesser then the metallic character would be more the ep would be more the rp would be more and the size is also more so i can put it here i can introduce this here if the size is directly proportional to rp size more rp more ep more metallic character more and ionization potential lesser ionization potential is lesser you must understand right so that is how you know the things are right so size more rp more ep more mc more ip is what lesser right so ultimately you discuss any periodic property in the periodic classification any periodic property in the periodic classification then understand that then understand that you know it is all about what size it is basically all about size you must understand right so this is the case so so if this is the case then let us actually see a discrepancy a discrepancy whenever it's a discrepancy it's a question in exam watch a discrepancy a discrepancy which is a question in exam question in what exam now let us understand this let us understand what exactly is this watch here watch here I can simply see the size of lithium take the case of first group 
Take the case of first group. Take the case of first group. Take the case of first group, right? In first group, I think these are the first group elements. Lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, and cesium, and francium. This is how it is. Lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, and what? A cesium. This, this, is the, this is the first group elements, right? And then, and then, if this is the case, then look here. The size of lithium is actually very, very small compared to size of cesium. I think you will agree with me. You will agree with me. Because when I take the first group from top to bottom, the size actually increases. In groups, of course, the size is what? Increasing. And what we, were, what we are doing is the lithium would be having the smallest size. And that's what I have written. Size of lithium is smaller than what? Size of cesium. Size of cesium. If this is the case, then we know reducing power is proportional to size. Greater the size, greater is what? Reducing power, you must understand. Greater is the reducing power. If this is the case, then understand even, then it implies that reducing power of lithium is actually smaller compared to this, uh, compared to what? The reducing power of cesium. Reducing power of lithium is less than reducing power of what? Cesium, you must understand. Right? So that is how it is. That's how it is. Then, then this is the case. This is the expected trend. This is the expected ones. But actually in reality, but in reality, in solution, reality in solution, in solution, in solution rather, in a medium rather, in a medium, then you find a discrepancy here. The discrepancy is, in fact, reducing power of lithium is greater, greater than reducing power of cesium, you must understand. In fact, lithium is a powerful what? Reducing agent and not what? Cesium. You must understand here. So, 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 if you look into first, understand the discrepancy what we are telling. Take the case of first group, right? Take the case of first group. And this is the first group elements, right? And the size of lithium is less than the size of cesium. Size of what? Lithium is lesser than the size of what? Cesium. That I think you will agree because from top to bottom the size will be increasing, right? And if the size of lithium is less than size of cesium, then reducing power is directly proportional to size. So we expect that the reducing power of lithium is actually smaller than the reducing power of cesium because both are directly related. But actually, in reality, in fact, the reducing power of lithium is greater than reducing power of cesium. And in a medium or in a solution, we need to give an explanation why. We need to give an explanation why, right? So the question is, let's, let's put the question properly and then explain why such a thing, why a discrepancy would be happening like this. Watch carefully here. Watch carefully. Please watch. We are discussing reducing power. Reducing power, right? And then we were telling the size. In fact, let me, let me start off with reducing power. Proportional to metallic character. Proportional to electropositivity. And it is inversely related to what? In fact, it's proportional to even size and it's inversely related to ionization potential. This is how the relations are. You must understand. Now, how you read them? How do you read them? So this, if the size is more, EP is more, electropositivity is more, metallic character is more, and the reducing power is more. Right? And the reducing power is more. You must understand. Right? And if this is the case, and size and IP are inversely what? 
related and all these are of course what inversely related. Now what I am doing, I will pick up two in all this. The reducing power I think must be proportional to the size. Greater the size, greater is what? Reducing power, that's what we are discussing now. So, 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 so. Here is the question. Even though, even though, even though, look into the question. This is the theoretical question which he will be asking. Which of the following is true and why? Assertion reasoning, right? Even though the size of cesium greater than the size of lithium, but still lithium is a powerful reducing agent in a solution, in a medium rather. And the question is why? Why, why, why? Why such a thing should happen? Why such a thing should happen? Cesium must be bigger in size. In fact, that is the biggest element in the periodic table. So the outermost electrons are actually far away from the nucleus, relaxing. It's easy for the electrons to be kicked out. It should be kicked out, right? It is easy for them. And then, and then, if that is the case, then cesium should be the biggest reducing agent in chemistry. Rather, lithium is a powerful reducing agent and not what cesium in a medium we need to give an explanation. So, I hope you followed the question first. So let's give the answer now. Watch. Let's give the answer. So why lithium is a powerful reducing agent than cesium? Let's give an explanation for this. Let's give an explanation for this. Right? So remember, if, if you are speaking of reducing agents, then you should be easily removing the electrons. Very, very easily removing the electrons. And for that, you should show a strong tendency to vomit. When you exhibit a strong tendency to vomit electrons, then it's easy for me to remove the electron from you. Right? If this is the case, right? If this is the case, then, then, then. Watch here. First of all, Lithium, comma cesium will have same sublimation energies, will have same sublimation energies. You must understand lithium, cesium, both will be having similar sublimation energies. Now why the sublimation energies are coming in between? Because when you wanted to remove an electron, it's called ionization potential. And if you have a closer look of the definition of the ionization potential, it is somewhat like this and I draw the attention. The energy required to remove an electron from neutral gaseous atom. Right? It's neutral gaseous atom. Now for that, first of all, we need to convert lithium and cesium both to a neutral gaseous atoms. From then, you are supposed to remove the electrons. From them, you are supposed to remove the electrons and that too in a medium that is water. That is water. So three steps are involved. First, convert the lithium and cesium to gaseous atoms. Second, you remove an electron. Third, in the solution, what is happening? So the sum total of all the energies in the step one, step two, step three will determine who is a powerful reducing agent? So what I will do, what I will do is I can write for a good reducing agent, what are the qualities? One, the sublimation energy is a factor. The second, ionization potential is a factor. And the third one, Solvation energy, that's in a medium, in a medium, right? Because in a medium, lithium is a powerful reducing agent and not cesium, so something is happening in the medium. So, if someone is asking in a medium, how do you judge a very good reducing agent? How do you judge a very good reducing agent? Then you have to say, you have to say 
that it is determined through sublimation energy, ionization potential and solvation. There are three factors which will actually influence for a substance to be a very good reducing agent. Why sublimation energies? Because good reducing agent is that where you can easily remove the electrons with lesser energy. And that energy is referred to be ionization potential. And what is ionization potential? You are supposed to remove the electrons from neutral gaseous atoms. Neutral gaseous atoms. You must understand. So for conversion into neutral gaseous atoms, first of all, you need to convert these elements into a gaseous state. A gaseous state. For that you need to sublimate it. Now what do you mean by sublimation? Straight from the solid state to a gaseous state. So first and first, you need to convert lithium and cesium to a neutral gaseous atom. That is to the gaseous state. And from the gaseous neutral atom, you need to kick the electron out. That is ionization potential. And the third one, once these ions are formed, after removal of the electron, the positive charge is developed. And this positive charge, how does it behave in the solution? All the three factors will actually determine you to be a very good what? Reducing agent, you must understand. Right? So if you want to be specifying it, then I can simply say for a good reducing agent, sublimation energies must be less Ionization potentials will be lesser and the solvation energies must be high. So what will make you a powerful reducing agent is the question. What will make you a powerful reducing agent is the question. Then I think you can actually write this. This is how it is determined. Reducing power To be max, reducing power to be max, right? You need to do, you, this must be fulfilled. The sublimation energy must be less, ionization potential must be less, and the solvation energy must be higher. So there are three things set, three factors that are set for making you a powerful what? Reducing agent. What are the three factors? One is sublimation energy, two ionization potential, three solvation energy. Right? There are three factors on which it depends. Right? So remember that. If this is the case, then let us now apply this to apply all the above factors. Apply this factors to lithium and cesium. Let's apply these factors to what? Lithium and what? Cesium, you must understand. Let us apply for them, right? When you want it to apply, then it is like this. Watch carefully here. For lithium, the best thing regarding first the sublimation energies. Regarding the sublimation energies. And what is that you are telling? The sublimation energies should be lesser. And this might be a question which I am hi actually highlighting in a box. Understand here, you want to choose an element between lithium and cesium whose sublimation energies are actually lesser. Lesser. And if that is the case, here is a point. If you want to sublimation energies, then let me tell you the sublimation energies of all alkali metals is same. That's a question in exam. The sublimation energies of all the alkali metals are same. For all alkali metals, the sublimation energies are same. So you have nothing to choose between sublimation energies for lithium and cesium. There is absolutely nothing for you to choose. Absolutely nothing to choose. Because the sublimation energies of all the alkali metals are same. Well, actually, for a good reducing agent, you should choose an element with sublimation energy lesser. 
But what I am telling here, the energy required for converting lithium atom to a gaseous lithium and the energy required for converting a solid cesium to gaseous cesium, both the energies are same. So sublimation energy is no differential for, uh, for a greater reducing power because the sublimation energies of both the elements are same, not only both. Well, I, would, I have written here and highlighted that the sublimation energies of all alkali metals is what? Same. It's same. It is absolutely same. So, the first factor is, is no applicable, uh, it's not applicable for what? Uh, judging the reducing power because the sublimation energies of both lithium as well as cesium is what? Same. Now, coming to the second factor. So, this is verified. I put a tick mark that is verified. So, I can simply say sublimation energy of lithium is almost equal to sublimation energy of cesium. That is verified. Now we have to investigate two other factors. One, ionization potential and the third one is what? The, how does it behave in what? A solvent that is nothing but solvation energies. And if you look into the specifications, for a greater reducing power, sublimation energy must be lesser, but both are same. Now we have to choose a fellow who has ionization potential basically what? Lesser. Now look into this. If this is the case, if you actually look into this case, look into this. Look into this case. Right? What we are doing is just judging ionization energies for lithium and what? Cesium. Let us actually judge the ionization energies for lithium and cesium. And we want to choose that fellow which has lesser what ionization energies. And remember, ionization energies are basically functions of sizes. And in fact, ionization energies are inversely related to size. And remember, size of cesium is very much greater than size of lithium. Size of cesium is greater than what? Size of lithium. It's greater. If it's greater, then I think the ionization potential of cesium is smaller than ionization potential of lithium, for lithium it is higher. So in the second factor, cesium has one. In the second, in the second factor, cesium has one. Because the ionization potential must be lesser for a greater reducing power. So cesium has won the match here. But in the first case, both are same. Sublimation energy is the same for both. And in the second, cesium has one. Now we have go for the third factor. Right? And the combination of third factor's energy, second factor's energy, and the first factor's energy will determine who is a better reducing power. You must understand that. Who possesses what? Reducing power uh, to maximum, that can be judged. But as far as now, the sublimation energies, that is step one, is same for both. And in the second, the cesium is possessing what? Least ionization energy. So it has scored marks than lithium. And now the cesium is standing what? First. But the game is not over. But the game is not over. We have to get into what? The third factor. That is what? Solvation energies. Let us see that. Now look into this. Factor three. All this happening in water medium, in water medium or a solvent, or a solvent, in a solvent. Now what did you do now till, till date now? You have lithium, you converted that into a gas and then you removed the electron from it. So you have now in your hands lithium ion. You have taken cesium. You have converted that into gas and removed an electron and the cesium ion is very much there in your hand. It is very much there in your hand. Right? 
So now you have lithium ion and cesium ion in the solution, in water. Now it is the third factor which will determine who is a very good what? Reducing agent. Who is a very good reducing agent? The third factor will determine. Now what is the third factor? Solvation energy. Now what is solvation energy? If you can write it, all this is happening in water. That is a water medium or a solvent. That is water. Then the lithium ion might be reacting with X molecules of water. And the cesium ions also react with Y molecules of water. And what happens? The water surrounds this lithium ion. So Li H2O X times plus plus energy, which is even because solvation is exclusively exothermic. It is never endo. It is never endothermic. It is always exo. Right? And then cesium plus of water is basically cesium H2O Y times plus that is E2. That is E2. You must understand. E1 and E2. And in this, in this, even in E2, both are energies released. And reducing power is the sum total, sum total of the ionization energies, the solvation energies, and the sublimation energies. Whosoever energy is higher, or net net the energy released is more, that will be judged as a powerful what? Reducing agent, you must understand. Or that elements will be having a higher what? Reducing power. And I was telling you very clearly as far as solvation is concerned, if you want a greater water molecules to surround a particular ion, if the X wanted to be more, then you must understand the size must be lesser. Smaller the size, more is hydration, more is solvation. More is hydration, more is what? Solvation. And in that case, the size of lithium is very much smaller than cesium. So the number of water molecules surrounding the lithium would be higher. So the number of water molecules loving this Li plus would be higher. Greater the love, great is more, more is energy released. So for smaller ions, the hydration energy would be greater. So I would like to say even is very much greater than what? E2. So now what is happening, if you look into the progress report of lithium and cesium in all the three steps, then it is somewhat like this. In sublimation energies, both scored same. Both scored same. You can't distinguish in step one. In step two, it is basically the cesium which passed. Cesium which passed. Because the ionization potential was lesser than what? Lithium. So you can easily remove electron from cesium and not for lithium, not from lithium. So I think cesium has passed the second step compared to lithium. But coming to the third step, the lithium has passed in distinction in the third step. In distinction. The difference between lithium and cesium, if it is 10 marks, and in the third, lithium has scored more than cesium by 50 marks. By 50 marks, somewhat it is like this. So net net what is happening, net net what is happening is basically the lithium sum total of sublimation energies, ionization energies and the hydration energy. Sum total if you see it is coming more for lithium and not for cesium in a medium. In a medium. Making lithium a powerful what? Reducing agent in a medium and not cesium. Even though cesium has a much better size, you must understand that. So, be clear on what factors that reducing power depend upon. Right. So, what we are telling is basically three factors which will determine the reducing power. Let me put it in an order, right? Then I think we can come to a conclusion. Watch carefully here. I draw the attention of everyone. Watch carefully. Look into this. Why lithium is a powerful 
reducing agent than cesium in a medium right that's a question so reducing power will depend upon three factors one sublimation energy the sublimation energy the sublimation energy second the ionization energy the ionization energy and the third one is of course what the solvation energy solvation energy se right and what are the clear specifications we are looking for we are basically looking for sublimation energy to be less ionization energy to be lesser and the solvation energy to be higher right so sublimation energy less ionization energy less and then uh, the solvation energy is to be on the higher side you must understand right if this is the case if this is the case then understand that for ionization potential for 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 for, for these two elements like lithium and cesium the sublimation energies are same they are same so nothing to choose between sublimation energies between lithium and what cesium there is absolutely nothing to choose between them and then third and the second and for the second i can simply say ionization potential of cesium is basically very less compared to ionization energy of lithium that is the second one here the cesium passed the cesium passed and lithium is left behind if not failed but cesium passed with better marks compared to what lithium and in third case and in the third case the hydration energy or i call solvation energy of lithium ion seems to be very much higher compared to the solvation energy or the hydration energy of cesium so the reducing power is basically a total of sublimation energy ionization energy and the hydration energy and the hydration energy and if you total this this for lithium it is higher it is higher than cesium it is basically the hydration energy of lithium which is beating the cesium in the second step in second step cesium passed with better marks than lithium but lithium passed in distinction compared to the second one so lithium is it is in the uh, higher it has a higher value as a sum total of se ie and he that's why that is the reason why the reducing power of lithium is much greater compared to the reducing power of cesium that is our conclusion you must understand that you must understand that right so ultimately ultimately this is what we, we, we i was explaining even though the size of cesium is much bigger compared to lithium the size of mass so size of what cesium is bigger compared to lithium but still lithium is a powerful reducing agent in a medium because in a medium the hydration energy that is purely exothermic completely dominates for lithium and that energy is partly used for removal of electrons where the uh, the lithium has failed in the second step for removal of the electrons some of it is compensated by the way of what a very very high hydration energy is you must understand right if this is the case then watch if this is the case that is the thing and then let us actually consolidate what we have done let us actually consolidate what we have done all things at one place all things at one place all things at what one place let us put all the things at one place number 1 number 1 each period each period is a shell each period is what a shell and shell is designated by the principal quantum number so i can simply say n value starts from 1 and you have infinity so it implies that it implies that you have infinite periods 
you have infinite periods in the periodic table the seventh period being what incomplete that is the first thing what I would like to say second thing second it has 18 groups and seven periods it has 18 groups and what seven periods you must understand right and then then three the modern periodic loss is physical chemical properties dependent upon atomic radii the physical and chemical properties are functions of atomic number rather in fact I call this to be atomic number and actually not what atomic mass as proposed by Mendeleev as proposed by Mendeleev it is basically uh, nothing but what it is uh, atomic radii or atomic number you must understand right and then coming to the fourth point operational definitions operational definitions for atomic radii for atomic radii are covalent radius covalent radius where I have a formula for you for covalent radius and remember that it is bond length which is equal to 2 into covalent radius this might be a question in exam remember that covalent radius 2 into covalent radius gives you the bond length because two atoms approach each other they don't overlap with one another they stop at one point then they stop at one point if you push them closer the potential energy actually increases so they stop at a point where the potential energy is minimum that distance can be called as what bond length you must understand the distance can be called as what bond length if that is the case then you have van der Waals radius van der Waals radius this is almost right van der Waals radius is basically greater greater than covalent radius remember van der Waals radius when it is greater than covalent radius it is prudent when I say prudent it is wise prudent meaning what wise it would be wise on the students to consider only van der Waals radius for noble gases and don't consider it for what covalent uh, sorry the uh, compounds which participate in what covalent bonding it's only for what uh, for people who don't participate that is noble gases but if you try and apply for people who participate in covalent bonding then I think you will end, end up with an error where the van der Waals radius is greater than what covalent radius you must understand and three you have ionic radii ionic radii and remember remember ionic radii is for radicals that is your positive charges and negative charges you must understand right and remember the size of ionic radii is determined by it's basically determined by z by e now what is z what is z it is the total positive charge it's basically a total positive charge right z is total positive charge right and divided by the total negative charge total positive charge divided by what total negative charge which will give you average force of attraction that will give you average force of what? attraction if the average force of attraction is higher then the size is what lesser so if you want to determine ionic radii use z by e use z by e that is average force of attraction then I think once you have z by e right if the average force of attraction is more then the size is lesser so it's inversely related to size the size will be lesser if the average force of attraction is what more so if you have a set of ions which have right same number of electrons then they also are called isoelectronic species the species which have same number of electrons can be also called isoelectronic species this might be a question in exam and observe I continue to write before I continue to write this must be a page of document 
who actually wanted to prepare for their exam, this should be in your pocket as far as periodic classification is concerned. Beyond this, there is absolutely nothing you get it in exam. Right? So what is this? Let's read it off before we rub it off. First, each period is a shell. And the same shell which is proposed by Bohr, where n value is 1 to infinity. 1 to infinity. If n is equal to 1, it is the first shell. 2, it is the second shell. Right? And you have infinite number of shells. So you have infinite number of what? Periods. And it has 18 groups in 7 periods. I am speaking of the modern periodic table. And the modern periodic table, the law also says that the chemical and physical properties are functions of atomic radii or atomic number and not the atomic mass, you must understand. Also, the most critical thing is atomic radii in the periodic table. So straight away we can't measure atomic radii, it's because purely idealistic. So we go in for an operational definitions, operational definitions, and the operational definitions are covalent radius, Van der Waals radius, ionic radius, and uh, you should not apply Van der Waals radius when you have a chance of what covalent radii, because already we live in an era and Van der Waals radius comes out to be much greater compared to covalent radius. So it's not prudent on the part of the student to consider Van der Waals radius for people who have the option of uh, participating in covalent bond. So Van der Waals radius is basically proposed for elements who don't participate in uh, bonds under normal conditions. And that I'm speaking of what noble gases you must understand. Right? If that is the case, then you have ionic radii. For ionic radii determination, for ionic radii determination, you must be using average force of attraction. Average force of attraction is total positive charge distributed among the total negative charges. So the average force experienced by an electron uh, under the influence of the nucleus can be called as basically what average force of attraction. And a question will be coming here that is uh, regarding, here is another point which I would like to quote. So all things at one place which we are discussing, you get a question on isoelectronic species. Isoelectronic species, that is the species with same number of electrons, same number of electrons. They have same number of electrons, you must understand. Take the case of aluminium. You have aluminium plus you have aluminium plus 2 and you have aluminium plus 3, right? So if you look into aluminium, aluminium atomic number, aluminium atomic number is basically, what is aluminium atomic number? What is aluminium atomic number? Right? Where is aluminium placed to the third group? That is below what? Below what? This is, this is the second group. Lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine. And then you have sodium, then you have magnesium, then you have aluminium. So it is 11, 12, and 13, right? The atomic number is what? 13. So if you look into Z for this, if I can write Z for this, aluminium, it is 13. For this also it is 13, because this is 13, 13. Right, because we are not removing protons, we are removed electrons, they got positive charge. So the positive charge remains the same. So the atomic number is 13, 13, 13, 13. But if you see number of electrons, then it is 13. Here one lost, that is 12. Here two lost, that is 11. Here three lost, it is 10. If you look into this, it is 10. So the number of electrons are basically varying here. So these are not isoelectronic species. With same number of electrons they should be having. Right? Then these are not electron, isoelectronic species, then how would you judge the sizes? In the exam he will give you. How do you actually basically judge the, uh, the sizes if they are not isoelectronic? Right? If that is the case, then you look here, you just calculate Z by E. What is Z by E? Average force of attraction. So that is 13 by 13, that is 1, that is 13 by 12, which is greater than 1, and this is 13 by 11, which is greater greater than 1, 
and this is 13 by 10 which is 1.3 which is further greater greater than 1 and just now we said the average force of attraction is inversely related to size so greater the z by e smaller is the size greater the z by e smaller is the size i think the greatest z by e you find it in aluminium plus 3 so the size of aluminium plus 3 is lesser than the size of al plus 2 less than the size of aluminium plus less than the size of aluminium that is how the trend of sizes uh, in aluminium when they are not isoelectronic is determined so it is basically the average force of attraction it's basically the average force of attraction uh, through which you can determine what sizes you must understand it's about what z by e you can see here aluminium z is same number of electrons are varying and z by e if you see one greater than one greater greater than one greater greater than one so if the average force of attraction is higher the size will be smaller and the highest you see it for what aluminium plus three so it will be having the smallest radius so the way to determine sizes when ionic in ionic uh, uh, the, the case of what ionic radii is through z by e that is nothing but average force of attraction that is nothing but total positive charge divided by the total negative charge so the amount of positive charge shared by these negative electrons can be called as what average force of attraction you must understand that is that is the another point then coming to the next one coming to the next watch carefully here is the case and i said electropositivity that's nothing but ease with which element loses electrons you must understand the ease now what is ease ease is nothing but tendency you must understand and i was telling you electropositivity is also a function of size in fact electropositivity is directly proportional to the size and i was telling you in periods the size decreases right so electropositivity also what decreases so in groups the size increases and then electropositivity also what increases you must understand so very good electropositive elements are placed to the extreme left you must understand that right and i told you its applications and if you recollect and i tell you if H plus, Na plus, K plus, Rb plus, Cs plus are running towards cathode for deposition. For deposition. If H plus, Na plus, K plus, Rb plus, Cs plus are running towards cathode for deposition, then the order will be like this. The order is H plus will be first. Second will be what? The uh, sodium. Potassium would be what? Third. Rubidium would be fourth. And cesium would be fifth. It implies that, it implies that less electropositive ion deposits first during electrolysis during electrolysis you must understand that right that's what it is you must understand so we are, we are basically we will continue to consolidate all the things and you are supposed to prepare a rough document rough document when i actually revise this chapter and i consolidate and put all the things at what one place rough document should be always there for people who are writing the exam